scroll, click. Scroll, click. Click. Scroll, click. Scroll, click. Scroll, click. Scroll, click. Click. Scroll, click. Click. Scroll, click. Scroll, click. Scroll, click. This is Synthetic Messenger. It's an algorithmic performance based in Zoom that consists of a hundred bots, each animated with a hand and a voice. And each one of these bots spends its days visiting climate news stories online and clicking all the ads that run alongside them. You're seeing a recording from a presentation of the work at the STRP Festival in 2021. As the bots traverse the internet, we see headlines for floods, for fires, for melting glaciers that are running alongside of ads for Viagra, new windows dongles, and all natural sleeping patches. And you've got to wonder, how did products for erectile dysfunction end up alongside of stories of climate collapse? How are they all in the same place? Well, as you know, this is the bizarre state of media today, where automated algorithmic systems juxtapose the trashiest attempts at online commerce with anxiety-inducing reports of our dire climate situation. And I created this work with Sam Levine to probe whether it was possible to leverage these opaque systems in response to our climate situation. Every automated click from our bots would trigger a tiny transaction that goes from advertiser to news outlet and theoretically would increase the value of that article, perhaps also causing it to be automatically aggregated in more spots across the internet, right, amplification. And we really made the work to ask questions about the digital advertising business model of the internet and to think about what the role um, of algorithmic media and automation is in how we understand our ecology and the climate crisis today. I'm an artist. I, um, I make eccentric engineering. And these are systems that ask questions about the political, cultural, and environmental impacts of our infrastructures. And sometimes these systems also prototype and envisage new ways of designing in concert with our environment, and I'm going to show you some examples of that later today. And so in the past couple of years, um, actually three or four years, I've been investigating how computational technologies, particularly AI, sh are shaping and reshaping ecological thinking, so how we imagine that we can live together. Computing and AI are increasingly assumed to be at the heart of many of um, the responses being developed to the climate crisis. And this is whether this is explicitly stated or not. So let's take a look at an example. Um, net zero, there's a lot of talk about net zero today. Net zero assumes that we're going to reduce fossil fuel use, but but that some will continue, right, and that we can develop carbon sequestration to mop up the rest of these emissions. And so geographer Holly Jean Buck writes about this, and she writes about how this net zero goal has actually eclipsed the prospect of ending fossil fuels use completely. And this is a, her fantastic book about this. Um, I think we should be concerned about this, particularly as many like IBCC and climate scenarios incorporate net zero rather than this prospect of ending fo fossil fuels. And at the heart of net zero remains a big computational challenge. As Buck says, how does anyone know when net zero happens? It's not like alarm bells go off. On a basic level, knowledge of a net zero state requires a lot of computing power for monitoring emissions and removals and determining the balance. In recent years, Microsoft has also launched programs that put um, AI in the service of environments. So AI for Earth is one, the planetary computer is another, and they describe this as AI-driven platforms to monitor, model, and manage Earth ecosystems. 
Google and satellite data companies like Planet Labs are also offering similar um, services. So we see big tech positioning themselves to play a central role in the ecological emergency. And it's obvious that these corporations have a lot to benefit um, from, from this. Microsoft's chief environmental officer, Lucas Joppa, muses, imagine if we had a planetary computer that could tell us exactly what we needed to do to protect planet Earth. But I want to ask you, do we need a planetary computer to see the hypocrisy of these corporations who, while they're developing these environmental initiatives, at the same time are deploying their AI in industry to find and extract fossil fuel resources that are still in the ground. And so the images you see on screen are images made with Microsoft Azure technologies showing geoscience data of fossil fuel resources off the coast of Australia and the coast of Brazil. And so these kinds of pursuits where they're putting AI in the service of fossil fuel extraction make all their other efforts seem little more than greenwashing. So we have this dilemma, right? On one hand, data-driven methods, planetary computing, these are all essential tools for understanding our climate crisis, for getting to net zero, for getting beyond net zero, and for managing carbon drawdown. We don't have the luxury of an anti-technological stance of the environmental movements in the 20th century. We just don't have the time. But on the other hand, and as I want to talk about today, much climate inaction is not because of a lack of data. It's not because of a lack of modelling or the inaccuracy of our modelling tools. Um, and framing the crisis in this way risks um, leaving the underlying causes unaddressed. So we've got to ask some critical questions of the emerging use of AI systems in environmental management. And I want to think about what kind of imaginaries and ways of thinking they encourage. We need to ask questions like, what do these technologies encourage us to overlook and pay attention to? How do their logics shape how we imagine we can live together? And how do data-driven systems and their use in automation change politics and environmental decision making. So today we're going to talk about this and I want to take you on a journey through some historic missteps in ecological measurement and management. And this will give us a way of pulling focus on computation as a way of knowing. From this groundwork, we'll then consider some of the limitations and possibilities of AI in, in the face of climate um, and ecological challenges. And finally, I want to think about what are some other possibilities for how we might think about intelligence and automation. Okay, so computation encourages us to see the environment as a system, which I think is something we're going to talk a lot about today. So what does a system's view amplify or edit out? Attempts to optimise the environment as systems have long predated computing. Throughout the 18th and 19th century, centralised forest management emerged in Germany. And this is where the German state began to measure, count, and model forests in order to extract timber from them. After they would fell the forest, they would then replant them in ways to optimise for timber yield. So this means choosing the fastest growing species for replanting and editing out low-lying bushes, fungi, anything that doesn't produce timber, as well as actually the traditional unofficial use of the forest by local communities. All this was discouraged um, as trees became commodities. Um, the scientific forest began uh, being managed like a factory. Species entanglements were seen as not important and, and irrelevant. And yet, after a couple of generations, the, the forest ecosystem deteriorated and timber yields actually began to drop. Modelling and managing the forest as a factory had oversimplified the reality of this ecosystem and the independencies of the species within it. So the scientific forest is a result of numerical approaches to landscape management applied in the name of extraction and capitalist economics. And it shows us that data collection and modelling is not neutral. In the 20th century, we have the science of ecology emerging in dialogue with cybernetics and systems theory. Cybernetics, the science of governance, inspired ecologists to pursue questions of control and self-regulation in the context of the living world. 
1935, um, oh, and I just love these diagrams, right? So this really shows us the, the way that ecology and technology was in conversation. Um, this is a presentation of an ecosystem where all of the energy circulating around the ecosystem is represented in the symbolism of uh, electronic circuits. In 1935, um, English botanist Arthur Tansley was famed for coining the term ecosystem. Uh, and this is a word to describe the systematic functioning of forests, wetlands, grasslands, and so forth. He saw ecosystems as made up of discrete units and was a firm believer in the idea of stability, that ecosystems would favor stability and that more stable systems would survive the longest. This has not been found in, in ecology. <laughs> Um, and towards the end of the 1960s, this assumption indeed was, was, being, was very difficult to prove. Um, ecologists were finding it impossible to prove. Um, and one of the experiments where this became apparent was called the Grasslands Biome. So this was a large-scale ecology project. There were many of them funded across the US in the 60s. This particular one, run out of Colorado State University, was an unprecedented attempt to comprehensively model a grassland system and build a virtual, a virtual model of it. And they aimed to uncover new ecological principles. It employed hundreds of researchers. They had to collect, uh, they went to extraordinary methods of collecting data. And so you see here a graduate student following a deer around. Um, and in a, in a voice recorder, he's recording everything the deer eats and excretes. And so they did this, you know, with, with, tried to do this with all the animals in the grasslands. Very frustrating dealing with insects and birds, as you can imagine. Um, they looked at soil microbiology, you know, they were, they were cutting creatures open and looking at their stomach contents. Um, and yet, they, there were not a lot of ecological principles revealed, despite this tremendous labour. Um, the project was deemed too simple, there was, it was too simple biologically, uh, despite you know, the unprecedented amount of variables they implemented in the, in the model as well. Again, I love this image of just being kind of overwhelmed by this, by this data collection task. The model had this bias built into it that meant it sort of always um, tended towards stability, Right, because there was this sort of overriding assumption that, that ecosystems had this, this characteristic. And you know, this grandiose idea of producing a virtual model of this large-scale ecosystem remained out of reach. So the scientific forest and the grasslands helps us see some of the assumptions that come with a systems view. Thinking complex realities of, uh, as systems implies sp that species entanglements are functional, it connotates the idea that the environment is bounded and knowable and made up of components operating in chains of cause and effect. And it encourages sort of a reductive view of the environment. So what other possibilities do we have? I mean, one word that's frequently used to describe environment in the humanities is the word assemblage. And this simple switch in language, I think, shows us a lot. If I say I'm studying a grasslands assemblage instead of saying I'm studying a grassland system, this shifts expectations of what I'm looking at in surprising ways. And the great tech writer, Catherine Hales, writes about this really well, I think. She says she uses the word assemblage because it's fleshy and it in, 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 it's, uh, implies touching and repelling and mutating and transformation. She says, uh, assemblage suggests a provisional collection of parts in constant flux, as some are added and others are lost. Parts are not so tightly bound that transformations are inhibited, but not so loosely connected that information can't flow between parts. So assemblage gives us an example that avoids some of the connotations of sy systems and reminds us that environments are irreducibly complex and that they always spill out from the technological metaphors that we try to assign them. The grassland shows us that modeling is a process shaped by human subjectivity. And it opens the question of whether collecting and importing way more data could have brought the model closer to reality. But data collection is also a practice that is shaped by what's considered important and peripheral. And even the growing capacity of contemporary computing 
um, even with that growing capacity, it, it can be dangerous to assume that more data just equals more reality. As an example, I'm going to tell you another story. So this is Joe Farman. He is on the left there, he, and he, this is his team working for the British Antarctic Survey. And this team is famed for first observing the ozone hole. They maintained a single ground-based sensor in Antarctica that measured ozone concentrations throughout the 60s and 70s. He was a stubborn guy because he maintained this sensor even when NASA launched satellites that could collect way, way more data. And then in the 80s, he noticed that his sensor was detecting a 40% drop in ozone levels. They thought, oh, you know, this must be a mistake. You know, NASA's not reporting anything. The sensor must be broken. They replaced the sensor, but they kept recording the data. Eventually, they published it in Nature, in what we now know is the first observation of the ozone hole. And so the question remains is, why didn't NASA's satellites report this? And a response from NASA suggests that they had implemented data processing software on the satellite to automatically discard readings that appeared to be outliers, thus ignoring the drastic changes that were happening to the ozone concentration around Antarctica. For NASA, reality itself was assumed to be an outlier and it was and discarded as an error. But what if there was no cap on the amount of data produced from the environment for analysis? Could models derived from data sets save us from these problematic assumptions like that of stability that we saw, you know, that, that made life so difficult for the grasslands modelers? Could machine learning help us deal with quantities of data beyond human comprehension and prevent the need for discarding outliers? And can these techniques produce a more robust representation of reality, free of human judgment? So, of course, these, are, these questions might be familiar to you. These are the arguments for machine learning. Machine learning um, is def was defined by uh, Arthur Samuel, a computer scientist in 59, as the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So this means rules and, log rules and logic emerge from patterns in data rather than from theory. I've made a number of works over the past years um, as a way to sort of understand and better feel out the characteristics of machine learning systems and the imaginaries that they carry with them. So this is a work called Deep Swamp, and it explores the way that AI is haunted by this dream of objectivity. So this dream that it's going to help us represent reality better. And the work is made up of a series of three wetlands, each of which are uh, managed by an artificially intelligent agent. And each agent is trying to optimise its environment for a specific goal. Each agent, they can change light levels, colours, water flow, fog. And so they're trying to optimise envir their environment's appearance armed with a camera that you can see hang hanging in the centre there and some software called an image classifier. The first wetland, Harrison's training data, is taken from photography of wetlands scraped from Flickr. So it's trying to produce a wetland that looks like this. The second, Hans's model has been trained on images of landscape painting from the history of Western art. And so it's trying to produce a wetland that, you know, looks, fits, fits into this data set. It looks something like this. And the third, Nicholas's understanding of an environment is something that has people in it. So its training data is of images of crowds. And so it's going to reinforce settings when there's a human or an audience in frame. So essentially it's trying to optimise for attention. Over many exhibitions, some of these wetlands have lived and some have died. Uh, and in some cases, the agent took a really long time to notice that their wetland wasn't doing so well. And this is because there aren't a lot of dead plants, photos of dead plants on Flickr. You know, we don't tend to take photos of these things. Um, and this points to one of the key limitations of machine learning and AI. Machine learning can only understand the world based on its training data. And I think it's important to remember that in the context of the environment, we do only have limited data sets, and it takes a lot of labour to collect this data, as we saw in the grasslands. You know, in many cases, we only have about 200, 250 years of good rainfall data, for example, and this makes the application of AI in the context of climate a real challenge. 
Machine learning also assumes the past is indicative of the future. And yet the story of the ozone hole shows us that environments can change in really non-linear, unprecedented ways. And this is being accelerated, of course, by the climate crisis. And it's another real challenge in um, applying machine learning in the context of environment. Of course, data is also produced in ways that are subject to context, culture, and politics. And so this means that who owns these systems, develops the technology, collects the data is significant. And as so many researchers have written on in the last few years, privately owned AI systems developed by a homogenous group of affluent people, is, it, these systems aren't likely to be applied in ways that understand the climate crisis as a result of violent histories of colonialism, imperialism, and the ongoing exploitation of the global south. Another way we see AI um, being applied in the context of sustainability is that it offers, is in ways where it offers imp improvements to, to efficiency in the production and distribution of resources. And the Jevons paradox uh, is a principle that shows us that technology can only do so much. Jevons paradox is a principle in sustainability that observes how improvements in efficiency, either by technology or policy, that are assumed to slow resource re use can in fact trigger lower prices that thereby can increase overall use and demand. So it can actually, by improving efficiency, you can actually um, have the opposite effect. And this paradox shows us that technologies alone are not gonna give us the change that we need to see when they're dropped into an economic context where the goals are capital accumulation and growth. Okay, so another imaginary associated with AI is this dream of depoliticized decision making. And I'm gonna return to our friend um, Lucas Jopper from AI from Earth, because he says it so well, right? He says, decisions about what actions to take will be easier to make and less vulnerable to politicization if we know what's happening on Earth when and where, and AI can help provide this information. And so this is a long-standing imaginary in technology more generally, where modeling and data collection or even outsourcing decision-making is gonna help us escape from you know, subjective politics. And theorist Peter Pollock writes about this really well in an essay called False Positivism. And he argues that this is oversimplistic. It's oversimplistic to assume that large-scale data collection and modeling will make planetary governance smoother. And he gives an example of how epidemiological models developed in the pandemic to assess risk became used in really different ways. He looks at a model called the COVID-19 model for incarceration that looked at prison populations and rates of infection in the US. And he, sh he shows how in some states this model and its results were used to decrease prison populations and early release prisoners. And then in other states, the, the results from the model were used to in, um, increase prison budgets and increase surveillance in prisons. Pollock reminds us that models can only do so much, and the ways that their insights are acted on or even automated remain deeply contingent on social context and political commitments. When we're talking about AI in the context of environment, um, I think it's also important to mention that it has a role in so many other places, such as the media, right? I return us to the, to the work Synthetic Messenger, which reminds us that privately owned algorithmic media platforms have really fractured uh, and polarized narratives around the climate crisis. So this digital advertising business model that runs the internet has really contributed to an era of post-truth politics um, and has um, made Cohering, getting coherence around a sort of narrative of what's happening to our environment, a real challenge. Climate reform is also platform reform. Okay, so while keeping these imaginaries and limits in view, can, I, can AI open up other possibilities for how we think about intelligence and automation? So I want you to consider a question that's long running in this field, and this is a question of what counts as intelligence. So currently, planetary computing requires vast amounts of energy, water, material resources. 
The water use of data centres has actually been in the news a lot lately, um, particularly because of the European drought. And the news article on screen is talking about how in the Netherlands, um, data centres are using a lot more water than what they were initially reported to use and what, when, when these projects were proposed, what the estimates were. In terms of energy, estimates show that the internet and its infrastructure now produces more carbon than the aviation industry, about 3% of global emissions. And of course, and I think we'll also hear about this later today, AI's carbon footprint is extreme. This graph here on the right shows us that training a large neural net um, has a carbon footprint five times larger than a US, uh, the, the carbon emissions of a US car over its entire lifetime. So, produces a lot of CO2. And so, is this the type of intelligence we should be investing in? Lots of researchers have responded to, to this situation. Uh, working under the banners of minimal computing, sustainable interaction design, and computing within limits. Artists like Joanna Moll have investigated the um, amount of energy required um, to buy a, a product of Amazon. She recorded all of the code your browser has to run when you do this. And of course, that means computational work, which means energy, and users pay for this in their energy bills. So Amazon does this sort of crafty thing of outsourcing um, computational work to their users. Low Tech Magazine um, redesigned their website recently to be hosted on a small-scale solar-powered server. And this meant redesigning it and thinking about UX in terms of degrowth principles to reduce its size and impact. Inspired by projects like this, Solar Protocol is the final work I want to share with you today, and it explores some of these minimal approaches to, to computing and to design. And also critically for us, it, it explores this question of what counts as intelligence. So the project takes the form of an experimental computational network, where decisions about the network's operation are automated not by an AI and a simulation, but by the environment itself. All right, so the work consists of a network of solar-powered servers. This is a solar-powered server. It's a simple system that uses a solar panel, a battery, to power a single board computer. And during the pandemic, we sent out systems like this to uh, volunteers around the world. These, we call these people stewards. And they set up these servers on the roofs of their houses, in their gardens, on the roofs of their art studios. And then we wrote custom networking software so that this network can collectively host a website and serve it from whichever server is in the most sunshine at the time. So if you visit solarprotocol.net at different times of the day or different times of the year, the website will be sent back to you from a different place in the network. This means that the work required to generate the site and send it out to your browser is done by the server that's generating the most naturally available energy at the time. Of course, you know, we are still relying on the internet, you know, the, the transmission between the browser and the server, we have to rely on internet infrastructure and it is quite difficult to estimate um, energy use and, and carbon emissions from that. So the project isn't carbon neutral, but it's an exploration of this. So given we were working with solar power, we also went through this design process of trying to design the website in the most lightweight possible, reducing the size of assets, we used a static site generator that meant the site generation happens on the server, powered by solar, rather than happening in the user's browser where it could be powered by fossil fuels. And it also meant that we could time computational work to happen when energy is abundant, so when the sun is up, and then all the processes on the servers slow down when the sun sets and there isn't a lot of energy. If you think about how large-scale web services work, they would have scores of servers in data centers all around the world. Think, you know, Amazon, Facebook, Google. And the way that traffic is directed between all these servers is a process called load balancing. Load balancing can happen in, tip in different ways, but typically traffic is routed to reduce the server response time and latency. So what do I mean by this? A Imagine you do a Google search and your browser sends out that request. 
the response would come back to you from whichever Google server is able to respond fastest. So often this is the server that's geographically closest to you. Generally, speed is prioritized over the other factors that determine how a network might operate. And we see this approach a lot in digital culture, right? We tend to optimize things for speed. But it doesn't have to work this way. Each of our servers measures solar radiation through its solar panel, and it shares this data out across the network. And then the server with the most sunshine generating the most energy sends an update to the network, and web traffic becomes directed towards it. And so you can see some of the data from our network here, the yellow sh indicating which server is the active server at the time, and this is 72 hours, so you can see it sort of jumps around regularly as the Earth rotates. And in this way, the system's not designed in a user-centered way, but in an environmentally-centered or energy-centered way. So we've been talking about the decisions we make as a sort of energy-centered design. This da same data is just shown in a radial form here. So unlike Deep Swamp, we saw Deep Swamp, right, where there were machine learning agents that were automating the management of environments. Here in Solar Protocol, we see the opposite. The environment itself is used to automate the management of the machine or of this network of machines. And the work, therefore, opens up new ways for us to think about automation and intelligence. The question of what counts as intelligence has haunted AI from its inception. And forgive me the long quotes, I know it's early, but <laughs> I think this is our last one. Um, this is a quote from Stephanie Dick, who's a historian of science, and she writes a lot about history of AI. And she writes that in the 20th century, human intelligence was the central exemplar around which early automation attempts were orientated. The goal was to reproduce intelligent human behavior in machines. So the AI of the 20th century, very different to the AI today, and researchers were trying to reproduce human reasoning. Today, most researchers want to design automated systems that perform well in complex problem domains by any means, rather than just human-like means. So, you know, statistical methods, massive data sets. And this dramatically highlights the fact is what, of what counts as, as intelligence is a moving target in the history of intelligence. So it's always it's been changing. And so rather than seeing intelligence as exclusively residing in the human or being a property that comes from human-made machines and statistical models, in Solar Protocol it emerges through interpreting planetary limits as logic. Planetary limits like locally available energy. Seasons, atmospheric conditions, the rotation of Earth, the reasoning and behavior of other species, all of these non-human influences have always dictated our decision-making. They dictate our decisions about our sleep schedule, about our cultural activities, about our food production, about our movements. We've always lived with these environmental or natural intelligences. How could we better read planetary limits as logic? How might we design in ways that lets, in, that lets the environment steer? Solar Protocol uses climate itself as a guide and organizing principle and suggests a way to design with the at-work intelligence of the environment here and now. Okay, last section. I'll just have a drink of water. So I just want to conclude by um, thinking about planetary computing. Solar Protocol is also a provocation for this. So one of the foundational concepts in computer science is the Turing machine, developed by Alan Turing. This is a theoretical model for a computer that can read and write data to an infinitely long roll of paper tape. This idea, this concept um, for a computer can, can compute any problem or program that any one of our computers on Earth can run. So really, like, it sort of opened up the, the field of computer science. But you've got to ask, where can one get an infinitely long roll of tape? 
So from the very inception of the field of computer science, there's been this imagination for computing as being infinite and unlimited. And that's mismatched with the material world, right? We live, we live in a material world, <laughs> as Madonna reminds us. Um, and we, live, we li have to live within planetary boundaries. And yet this imagination continues through the, through the field. You know, it's present in the early imagination for the internet as this virtual space without limits. And it continues in projects like this one, Destiny. This is a project that, quote, will revolutionize the European cap capability to monitor and predict our changing planet based on the integration of extreme scale computing and the real-time exploitation of all environmental data. But there are many other approaches to environmental governance that, don't, that rely less on the expansion of computing and increasing the resolution of simulations. So let's look at another example. Oh, another quote. <laughs> um, the Honourable Harvest. So the Honourable Harvest is a protocol that Robin Wall Kimmerer writes about. She is a plant biologist who writes a lot about how to bring Western science into dialogue with indigenous knowledge practices. And she writes about the Honourable Harvest, which is a protocol that was developed and used in um, North American indigenous communities. Um, this is a practice and philosophy that guides the manner in which we take from the living world. It's a protocol of asking permission, evaluating impact, taking only what you need, using appropriate technology. It has many permutations, but basically it's a, simple, it's a set of rules for gathering resources from one's bioregion. These include rules like never take the first plant that you see, which is actually a really sophisticated way um, to ensure that you're never going to harvest the last member of a species from a region. Another one is never take more than half. So if you're harvesting things, leave half. Again, another sophisticated way to ensure that you're never over, over harvesting a region um, past a point that it can regenerate. And we were really inspired by this when we, we developed the Solar Protocol project. These are rules for resource management and um, they're echoed in other places such as E.O. Wilson's Half Earth Project. This scales them up to a planetary scale and it's a proposal that in order to maintain a, a healthy biosphere, we should allocate half of the planet's surface to nature and to restoration and conservation. Of course, this project still involves monitoring and modeling, but in a way that services this simple heuristic that we can all understand. So despite the present day focus on data collection and simulation tools, it's neither a lack of data nor the inaccuracy of modeling that is preventing a delay, uh, that is preventing climate action. You know, if we look at some of this history, you know, in 1856, Eunice Foote was the first scientist to publish on the warming potential of CO2, and she speculated that heightened levels of CO2 in the atmosphere would warm the Earth. In the 70s, the limits to growth, highly criticised, but this, this model's predictions of the pollution crisis are roughly on track of where we are today. In 2017, you know, we know um, more than 15,000 scientists signed the warning to humanity. It's the most signed um, publication in the history of science, and it's an urgent call for rapid and radical transformation. So inaction is not due to a lack of information. It's not due to the resolution of our models. Um, it's due to a lack of political will to act. And it could be argued that the endless pursuit of improving the scale and accuracy of our computational technologies is a seductive decoy that lets us avoid confronting the underlying logics of the emergency. So to, to return to a dilemma I posed at the outset of this talk, we need computing, we need data systems in response to the climate emergency, but on what terms? Grappling with computation in my work has let me see um, AI and computing as this sense-making practice that can reveal a lot, but it can also bracket out a lot of the irreducible complexity of our environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
You've tied my brain in, I hope, very constructive <laughs> knots. Because on one hand, okay, we're so systems thinking dangerous because it's reductive, and especially if it's intended to translate complex, rea messy realities uh, into these sort of simplified models. At the same time, systems thinking absolutely necessary to understand complex, messy realities so that we can have mental models that, that work. I mean, I guess the sort of un planetary limits understood as logic is also systems thinking, right? So already there, I'm like, <sighs> I guess my first question to you then is, before we let the room in, is, so wait, how do I monitor myself, my own internal models for those same biases? Where do, how do I keep check on my own systems thinking? I mean, this is the dilemma, right? <laughs> it's, I, I, I think um, my conclusion to all of this research has been to understand that seeing the world as system is, is, is the adoption of a whole lot of, is, is just one perspective, right? Uh, it's a perspective we need, it's very useful. It's so commonplace, we kind of forget that it even exists. We forget the thinking in systems has a history, yeah. that it came from somewhere. Uh, it's powerful, but I think we also need to re just remember that that it's never going to capture everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, as, as a systems thinking, as opposed to thinking of things individually and trying to solve problems w without their context, is somehow still necessary. So it's there's something there about yeah, I guess being able to keep many hold many thoughts in our mind at the same time, or hold many principles. Uh, many approaches, which is challenging, but awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see if we have a question from the room. Uh, I will remind you again to give your name and just a tiny bit of context uh, if you ask a question. Who is brave this morning? Nobody's brave this morning. Yes, somebody's brave here on my right. I'm completely not brave, but <laughs> I'll just have to do it. <coughs> so you're, um, I forgot the exact name, but the solar powered um, system of computers, do you think that would be um, able to be made commercial, a problem, uh, uh, a project like that? That's not its goal. <laughs> <laughs> not the goal, but I ask because, you know, we are a lot of people who are trying to rebuild things that work in a way that's not constructive for us. You mentioned uh, advertising, uh, social media, stuff like that, but a lot, of a lot of the times we run into this problem that, you know, there's companies that are making billions of money and then the rest of us are just making, or j not just, but we're making art and we're making projects that are great, but they're just not having the same impact because sometimes you need sort of the commercial driver to have a huge impact in the world. So in a way, it's two separate questions. One question is, will it scale enormously? And the other question is, will it also potentially be profitable, I suppose? Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, I, I, get, I have gotten this question a bit with this project. Um, and I think it's a question that often comes about from making art that is functional. Right, there's this question of is it, can we apply it, does it scale? I see Solar Protocol as a provocation and as a way of developing thinking. Um, of course, you, it could be scaled up, it could be, we could, you know, package up solar servers um, and send them out. I don't think, um, I think we, if, if the goal is like sustainability and reducing resource use, um, doing this at a small scale is probably not the way to go. But in terms of developing literacies of, how solar, of the characteristics of solar power, what it means to live with a system like this, what it means for then how we have to change our expectations around how the web works, what um, online culture is like, then it's really useful and really powerful, right? Because it does, um, it does demand that we shift our expectations of like what success and failure is and, and what, um, what the internet should look like. Um, so I know I'm sort of dodging your question a little bit, but um, 
I think it's a provocation, right? And and we we don't we don't intend to scale it up and and send solar servers out to everybody. <laughs> and that does connect to something else you were talking about, because of course these massive data centers, the, these enormous global companies can save a lot of money, which is to say make a lot of money by making their data centers increasingly efficient. So yep. they're very good at that. But yep. that brings us to Jevons paradox. They're they're making all of this carbon emission savings essentially and then using their increased wealth to make us scroll even longer and stay on the services and use them even more. Yeah. So it again brings back th I don't know, it this is why this is this is why you just broke my brain. Like <laughs> wait, how do we how do we break the Jevons paradox then? Then we have to have a complete lifestyle change, which of course we know we need to have anyway. Right, right, because <laughs> because these aren't technological problems, right? They're problems of economics, they're problems that can be solved through regulation, they're problems that might be solved through breaking up big tech, right? You you're talking about scale and the difficulty that we the situation we're in, right, where it's really hard to contend with these companies that are that are large scale. So unfortunately I think a lot of these problems they, they don't have these neat technological solutions. Does anyone have one more? In that case, I'm going to throw the same at you that I did at some of the speakers yesterday. And the others picked it up as well. What gives you hope? <laughs> <laughs> I apologize <laughs> for this question. I'm just desperately... This is the curly <laughs> question at the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think creative work, like the work that we're all involved in, gives me hope because there are so many ways to think about these problems and we do have, we actually do have the responses and the, the tools we need to solve this crisis. Again, it's not a lack of our of technological prowess and so that can be daunting but it can also be hopeful, right? Because um, we can act and we can act soon. I love that. Too. And I love that that's becoming kind of a recurring answer. We have already solved this problem, we just haven't implemented the solution, mm. which is very different from what the headlines look like. No way. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, dear friends. Tiga Brain. Thank you.